Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Thursday, April 25th, and in this episode, we're going to talk about amphibious ships. But first, a word from our sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Valletta Industries. Valletta Industries is a premier maritime and tactical training company founded and comprised of former U.S. Navy SEALs. They offer best-in-class trainers for the Department of Defense and local law enforcement. The Valletta team has a passion for instructing and continuing to support the mission of active duty personnel and first responders by lending their hard-earned experience to those brave Americans who still serve. If you're a government contractor looking for a great partner for your next big project, Valletta Industries is an SBA-certified hub zone and SDVOSB company. Valletta Industries. We solve problems. To learn more, go to www.valettaindustries.com. Okay, before I introduce my guest today, I have a couple public service announcements. First, coming up on the 8th of May, we're going to host our annual meeting starting at 1600 Eastern Daylight Time in the Jack C. Taylor Conference Center. We'll recognize essay contest winners and our authors of the year. Uh, Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Eric Smith, will be our keynote speaker. He is now confirmed, so that is great news for us. The event will be broadcast live. If you can't get to Annapolis, go to usni.org slash events to find out more. Uh, and second, if you're going to be at Modern Day Marine, 30 April, 1 May, or 2 May, uh, please stop by the Naval Institute booth. I'll be there for a couple of days. A number of uh, our other members of our team will be there. It'd be great to have you stop by. We'll probably record a couple episodes of the podcast from uh, from a booth just like we did last year. Uh, very excited, as always, to be back at Modern Day Marine. Uh, and now for our guest. Joining me today is retired Marine Corps Major Carl Forsling. He's the author of an article in the April issue of Proceedings. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. So you're joining us from, uh, you said, just outside Dallas? That's right. I'm in my uh, humble office here in uh, Grand Prairie, just a suburb of uh, Dallas-Fort Worth. Nice, nice. Uh, so let's start with a bit of your background. You were a Marine Corps pilot. What did you fly? So I uh, started out in CH-46s, as is uh, not uncommon for my era, and then uh, following a tour and starting at flight school. Uh, um, the V-22 was just standing up, and I was one of the first guys uh, from the fleet chosen, you know, outside the test community to, to stand up the, 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 the uh, Osprey community. So I was a initial cadre there as we stood up fleet squadrons and uh, pretty much flew Osprey for the rest of my career. Nice. And what year did you retire? Uh, it's 2015. 15. Okay. So coming up on nine years ago, what'd you do after you retired from the Marine Corps? So, uh, yeah, after uh, spending almost my entire time flying, I, I thought I was going to keep doing that for the rest of my life. So uh, I left the Marine Corps. I got a job as a uh, flight officer with uh, the Baltimore City Police. So I uh, flew police helicopters with uh, Baltimore City for about two years. Um, and eventually I came to the realization that it actually pays better to uh, talk about aircraft and military equipment than to actually operate it. Uh, so I ended up uh, switching, you know, via the usual you know, long story of friends of friends to uh, doing business development. I worked for uh, Bell Textron uh, for about seven years, doing business development for V-22 program, doing some for military sales, and lastly, the future vertical lift. And uh, just recently moved to uh, Airbus US uh, to work on some of their military programs. Cool. Um, so I'll, I'll tell our listeners, uh, and we don't have to tell the whole story, but um, Carl and I are connected via a common friend, Ward Carroll, and uh, I met you, Carl, out at uh, at Tailhook last year, out in Reno. But you and Ward and I had uh, had beers one night, and you told this amazing story. It was, uh, I think you you framed it as your best combat story, which was actually not as a Marine Corps pilot, but as a Baltimore City helicopter pilot chasing after, uh, you know, guys who are like. Uh, terrorizing the city of Baltimore on, on motorbikes and like a three hour flight chasing somebody over the airspace in and around Baltimore and BWI airport. And it was a fascinating story. Uh, yeah, I, it's the flying there is great. I mean, it, it was, you're flying a little at the time they flew a uh, Eurocopter 120s, um, which is a, a nimble little thing going from a V-22 to a, a 120 was sort of like going from a Lincoln Continental to a, a Kawasaki Ninja. And uh, at the time I was there, there was a, a big problem with dirt bikes being operated in the city, and it's hard to chase a dirt bike with a police car. 
So a lot of times we get tasked to chase those guys down and, and uh, vector patrol cars and other assets onto them. So those things fly through the city and it's, it's kind of like Star Wars Canyon there sometimes. So it, it was, I, I won't complain about the flying. There were other things about that job that would have changed, but, but the flying was equal to anything I got to do in the military in a lot of ways. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, so let's get to your article, and and, and I'll tell our readers that, that I, I think your article in the April issue is, is a really it's a classic proceedings piece. Uh, this is a, an example of an author sees a problem, identifies a solution, and offers a plan of attack, and that's really um, kind of the the meat and potatoes of proceedings. So, Carl, describe the problem that you see. Uh, sir, working big to small. I, I think it's no secret the Marine Corps views amphibious shipping a lot differently than the Navy and uh, the importance of that. And there's been a, probably a generation long fight about what the right number of amphibious ships is. You know, it's 35, then it was, re, you know, with a resource constraint of 31. And then with force design, that even got more complicated as General Berger uh, tried to reform the structure of the Marine Corps and how they interacted with the Navy. Um, and so with his concept of moving to a uh, what's now called LSM, uh, landing ship medium. It was light amphibious warship initially, uh, wanting some section of that amphibious lift to be this new breed of smaller amphibious ship uh, that amphibious requirements allowed to float and become less solid. Um, and that, you know, as we've seen, you know, the Navy's resourcing issues, you know, we've seen several MUs start to miss deployment. So we already have an existing shortfall. And now we've finally come to an agreement between the Marine Corps and the Navy about where this is going. Uh, but we've we've agreed to 31 sh amphibious ships plus a, a larger number of these LSMs. But now we've bifurcated the services effort. And uh, I worry programmatically that's going to lead to escalation. And we're going to end up trying for both programs and really getting neither in the end. Um, and also, I think there's also a time to threat issue. Um, the, the, the planet, as it's currently envisioned, most of it's not going to be fielded until late in the decade or even the 2030s. And if you look out there, a lot of the experts are saying that there's a potential for conflict in the Indo-Pacific much sooner than that. So what assets do we have that we can build shipping for and, and put out there uh, you know, to deter that conflict, if necessary, fight it in the time frame we actually think that might happen in? Yeah, I'll add a couple things there. So you're sort of referring to the Davidson window, which we're very much in the heart of right now, where former uh, Indo-PACOM commander uh, Admiral Phil Davidson mentioned that um, you know the Chinese military has been given the task to be ready for a, uh, a military solution to the Taiwan problem by 2027. That's just a couple of years from now. The landing ship medium um, that requirement still, I don't think, from what I understand, has not been set in stone yet. And so there's not a contract, there's no bid, there's no, nobody, there's no, you know, we're, we're years from bending metal to start building landing ship mediums. Uh, and so if we're looking for amphibious lift, uh, expeditionary lift, EABO kinds of things, uh, there, there, there won't be an LSM to be part of that, as you point out, till probably end of this decade is probably a rosy projection, you know, especially when you look at uh, some of the other shipbuilding pro programs that the Navy has had delays with, you know, there's just a constant news drumbeat about uh, the industrial, um, uh, you know, the industrial capacity to produce ships. You look at the Constellation class frigate, recent reports are that that's three years behind now in the power curve. And that, that was approved years ago. Right. And the first one won't be commissioned uh, until like three or four more years. So we're, we're running three years behind on that. And the Navy keeps saying we're um, getting more and more delayed on the Columbia class SSBN. So a desire to build a new class of ships is, is one thing. The actual ability to build them on time, on budget, and you know quickly and and um, you, you know in in large enough multiples is a is a big problem. So uh, so you write in your article that the solution already exists uh, in in a large in a class of large expeditionary ships, uh, and many of our readers probably aren't even aware of these two uh, classes of ships, uh, but the Navy already has them. So what are those ships, and what are the capabilities that they bring? So the, you know, there's two ships, uh, you know, the ESD and the ESB. Um, both are commercially derived off the uh, Alaska class commercial oil tanker. Um, 
ESD was actually the father of, of the class, and that was there were two of them built. Uh, and basically, it's uh, Exeter Sherry Support Dock. Uh, it was originally built to tra uh, transfer equipment from pre-positioning shipping, you know, while at sea, uh, and then transfer that to either LCACs or LCUs. Um, so it gives you, you know, the ability to beach that equipment. Um, then, the, yeah, that's the so it's a, a large flat deck that can semi-submerge and uh, launch those LCACs and LCUs. So those large end-item carriers. Um, and those have been put in uh, operational reserve. The other flight is the uh, ESB. Uh, the main difference to that, instead of submerging to uh, land LCACs and uh, LCUs, it adds a flight deck and a mission deck. So that flight deck capable has four spots, all capable of carrying your large helicopters or tilt rotors, so 53s, B-22s, a couple of parking spots for stowed birds and a, and a maintenance hangar. Has a mission deck, and, and you know, in the past, it's been used to support special operations. So uh, you're talking about uh, uh, rigid raider boats, things of that nature being launched via the crane from that deck, as well as uh, some smaller craft and, and mission equipment. Um, and uh, you know, both these ships, uh, large tonnage ESD is around 70,000 plus and tons, and then uh, ESB 90,000 plus. So these are significant ships. Uh, I think one of the big things it has going for them, and uh, besides just the industrial, uh, the ability to build them because they're commercially designed is that that size gives them the size, weight, and power trades that just aren't present in the landing ship medium. And what I mean by that is, you know, any engineering problem, whether you're talking aviation, whether you're talking shipping, whenever you're trying to add things to a platform, uh, the things you have, do you have space for it? Uh, can't support the additional weight? And do you have the electrical or other power to power this equipment? And especially, you know, in today's environment, you, you tend not to add things to the base product. You tend to add systems as those things are released and developed. And if you have a, a much smaller ship like the LSM, no matter how well designed, and you tend to get, also tend to add a lot of requirements creep there, which increases the price and so forth. If you can do modular systems on a larger platform that has the physical and the electrical space to add them, you know, whether that's uh, integrated onto the ship or whether that's just using, you know, the systems that the embarked Marines have, whether that's air defense, Whereas electronic warfare, whether that's uh, uh, missile systems, either containerized or other, just off the deck of the ship, uh, the potential combinations and the realm of missions, uh, both for EABO and other Navy missions, it just goes up dramatically as opposed to a small specialized ship design. Yeah, and the uh, ESDs, well, we, we're not making any more ESDs right now. As you said, they're, they've been put essentially in a, uh, um, I don't know, what was the status you, you, you described? I believe the Navy calls it operational. It's operational reserve, so it's not truly uh, put in mothballs. It's uh, could theoretically be turned up, but there's no crew assigned on a permanent basis, and it would take some time to, uh, to uh, get them out to sea uh, as it stands right now. Got it, but the ESBs uh, are active ships. They've got... Uh, a number on each coast. Uh, we had an article a couple of years ago from uh, the, the CO, XO, and OPSO of one of the first ones that deployed over to Fifth Fleet and described, um, essentially, it was like an experimental deployment. Let's see how we can use this thing, right? And as you pointed out, there were some special operations, there was helicopter operations, there were, um, uh, you know, a, a number of different capabilities uh, that were kind of, you know, tested, proved, shown with with different force packages uh, on this. Uh, and, and these are like 850, 900 foot long ships. These are these are large ships, as you said, based on the Alaska class oilers that are Jones Act compliant, uh, you know, double hulled tankers that take oil from Alaska uh, to um, uh, refineries, you know, on the West coast of the United States. So very, very large ships. They're built by NASCO, uh, shipbuilding in San Diego. And, uh, yeah, at, at these are ships that are, there is already a hot production line, uh, going for these. Um, so the, the Navy and the Marine Corps are pressing ahead with, uh, plans to build or design and build the, the landing ship medium. Um, what's what's the problem with that solution? Other than hey, it's not going to be ready for a few years. Uh, you know, there's some on the tactical level, and there's some of the larger program type issues. That I think we sort of touched on you know obliquely before. 
you know, first of all, it is slow. And, and granted, the ESB, ESDs are, are approximately the same speed. You're talking around 15 knots. Um, but on a smaller ship, I think that it's when it's coupled with a short range, that gives you two sorts of problems, is especially when you're talking in regards to EABO, when you're talking about trying to uh, live inside the Chinese WES, when you have a short range and slow ship, that means all you have to refuel inside that WES somehow. And that means you're relying on host nation fuel, which you may or may not have access to, uh, depending on how this conflict goes, or it brings in you know, your oiler ships from the regular Navy, which are you know, already tasked with supporting destroyers, which are doing important work out there and, and resupplying carriers. And so you're bringing them deeper into the West to support these amphibious ships. And again, in terms of overall theater priorities, you know, where are those going to shake out when uh, surface ships, you know, major surface combatants uh, also need that fuel. So, you know, relative to an ESB or ESD with a 9,500 mile range, which can get in and out under their own fuel, that's a significant liability. Um, as we talked about before, that limited growth growth potential, um, they pretty much are a one-trick pony. They take Marines uh, in a reinforced platoon, you know, company minus size element with their associated equipment. They beach and land them, and there's not a whole lot else they do um, other than circulate those Marines around the, the battle space. And that may or may not be survivable. Uh, we see the, the you know, as the requirement develops, the, the Navy and Marine Corps are adding more survivability to them, but that adds cost, um, and that also further endangers the, 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 the platform from a programmatic standpoint. Uh, we originally were looking for $150 million. There are some estimates now saying that might escalate to almost $300 million, and now you're talking in the, you know, you're getting close to, closer to the price of a much more capable ship, but you're getting a lot less out of it, and especially with the possibility of less than robust Navy commitment to amphibious ships in general, and probably specialized amphibious ships even less, you know, that puts the, you know, I would say the LSM concept in a little programmatic danger if there's any further uh, budget pressure on the Navy or Marines. Yeah, so uh, let, let's dig a little bit deeper on uh, on two things there, cost uh, and then and uh, survivability, because you mentioned both of them. So the alternatives here to to your concept is you know that the navy's got the current program of record we're building the san antonio class uh, uh lsds did i say that right lpds LP, sorry lpds um san antonio class lpds a and and those are very capable amphibious warships right they've got a large flight deck mm -hmm. they've got a, a well deck um you can move a lot of marines a lot of stuff uh, and and they are built to military specifications, but they're also about two billion dollars a piece, right? And so that gets to uh, you know the the commandant has uh, is it, the commandant is now given the task of setting the the amphibious shipping requirement, right? So the Navy doesn't get to say this is how many amphibious ships we need. The the Marine Corps actually sets the requirement, and Congress put that into the budget a year or two ago. So that 31 L-class ships, right now we're building uh, LPDs, right, the, the San Antonio class. Um, and then to the, the LSM, as you said, smaller, lighter, less range, et cetera. Um, but there's been some debate within OSD CAPE about what the survivability requirements should be, right? Does it have to be able to defend itself? Does it have to have, you know, does it have to be armored in certain places? And as you pointed out, you know, there's those are programmatic risks. It adds costs, but also adds time. Uh, so talk a little bit about, um, so first the, the cost of the, uh, of the Alaska class, you know, the ESD, ESB, is there 500, $550 million to build one of those ships? So LSM might be 300 million, um, but a much, much smaller ship carrying a lot less Marines and stuff, right? Um, but but still a, a quarter the cost of a San Antonio class ship. Right, exactly. I mean, the, the, the last one of, of class, I believe, was clocked in at 550 million. And of course, the last couple of years, there's been some escalations. So you're probably talking the, the 600 plus missionization. Um, so roughly twice, but you get more than twice the capability and more than twice. You know, a uh, LSM does not have a, it may be able to accept BERT rep and light, lights uh, unmanned aircraft, but it's unlikely to have a substantial aviation element, whereas the, ES, you know, the ESB can. Um, that's just an example of that. Um, so the, the, the cost benefit equation, uh, you're getting more than, two, you know, it's carrying almost 200 troops as opposed to your 50 to hundred on the LSM. So, uh, 
when you combine that with the ability to take all these different payloads and perform more than one mission than just delivering Marines to a beach, uh, facility in both the Marine Corps scheme maneuver and the Navy's uh, maritime scheme maneuver and be become part of that uh, shooter sensor in that larger fight, uh, the value of a ESB and ESD combination, uh, I think goes beyond just the, the ship to ship comparison, but how these things fit into a larger system. Um, and lastly, I think the, uh, as far as that flexibility, it's not just for EABO and the China fight. Uh, a lot of problem is the Marine Corps force generation for just MUSE and other contingency operations. The things that happen tomorrow will happen 10 years from now and are part of what the, the country expects the Navy and Marine Corps to do, which is whether it's humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, whether it's uh, non-combatant evacuation operations, the ESBs can still facilitate that. You know, they have an aviation element. So yes, they're 15 knots instead of the notional 20 knots that we market our amphibious fleet as being able to move at. But for an extra day of steaming, you bring a uh, robust capability um, that's equal to the LPD and that's a non-combat environment. When the LSM is largely incapable of projecting any assets ashore except at the, at the actual beach. Um, so in terms of flexibility for the, not just the China fight, but the near term uh, crises we have around the world, these contribute to that uh, just as much as the, L the LPD uh, while still retaining the ability to uh, you know, face larger threats uh, with a near peer competitor. Yeah, and it was maybe two years ago now uh, where the Navy and the Marine Corps came under fire because there was a, a need to do a non-combatant evacuation operation in uh, uh, Northwest Africa, Sudan, and we just didn't have, there, there, there wasn't a MU close by. There wasn't uh, a Navy Marine Corps response option uh, for that, that, uh, that contingency. And as you point out, that for those kinds of operations, HADR and uh, non-combatant evacuation operations, you don't really need a survivable platform, meaning it's not going to come under hostile fire or probably is not, right? You, you right. know, you're, you're operating off the coast of Sudan, the coast of, um, you know, uh, Bangladesh or, a com you know, a country that's been hit by, a, uh, you know, natural disaster and the, the, the need is to project um, humanitarian relief supplies or Marines um, or both, uh, you know, ashore to help with that situation or to, you know, evacuate Americans out of, out of harm's way. So um, talk a little bit about, because it's in your article about the survivability of the ESD and the ESB. So these are based on commercial tankers, uh, but you point out something about, you know, hey, there's, there's some survivability just built into having a, a, a double hull tanker, um, you know, hull. Yes, I, I think there's, you know, and that comes to a larger issue of, hey, how specialized does that have to be? And, you know, do we let perfect be the enemy of the good? Uh, I just, you know, obviously we want our, you know, Marines, sailors, soldiers, airmen to be as protected as they can be. Um, and so it's always the temptation is not, nothing is too good for them. And that is, that is true, um, but it's still a, a balancing of, of risk versus versus cost at a program level. And so, for example, these commercially derived their uh, ships, you know, they're built as oil tankers. They do have a double hull that's designed to keep oil in, but presumably also water and, and uh, some small arms fire out. Um, where, you, where you're going to lack is some of the compartmentalization that a purpose-built ship is going to have as far as damage control. You do have similar, very similar firefighting capabilities, and they're, they have some of the same integrated firefighting installed in the newer uh, builds, as you'll see a naval ship. But that is that is a gap in capability. Um, but there there is that decision point as you know, how much risk is acceptable. Is it acceptable risk to have a imperfect ship with that may not have the naval level survivability, or is the greater risk not to have a ship at all? And that's kind of the point where we're at with building ships with limited amount of naval shipyard capacity we have, being able to tap into commercial derivatives, whether it's you know these particular ones or tap it, be able to tap into other civilian shipyards to generate you know some of the shipping that goes against both the amphibious shipping gap, you know, and larger you know uh, ship gap we have with China overall, um, and tapping into the capability. Um, again, going back to the size, weight, power, these things can host missiles that could be controlled by other you know, naval vessels. We talked 20 years ago, there's the Arsenal ship. We never went that way. But in effect, you can buy the same thing with the modularity this type of platform has. So yeah, while it does have you know 
we have to make hard choices. And this is perhaps one of them, um, is that not every ship, you know, we'll have to integrate that uh, thought in there. It's, you know, what is the risk benefit? Where is this going to be employed? Can we mitigate that by pairing it with other ships or, you know, teaming them and making a system of systems where it's collectively we're achieving acceptable level of survivability for the threat we're trying to face? Yeah, I'm, I'm reminded of a, a couple of things. One is an article that uh, has echoed uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, the the uh, It was called uh, Payloads Over Platforms by former uh, CNO Admiral Greenert. Um, and uh, so this you know, the idea of taking a commercially uh, designed platform and doing more with it just reminds me of that. Like, it's not about the platform, the ship itself. It should be more about the, the payload that you're putting on it. And in this case, those, uh, those ESDs and ESBs with that massive mission deck uh, and flight deck, uh, are, are they, you, you you could put lots of different payloads on that, right? You could put Marines, you could put helicopters, you could put UAVs. You know, we're talking about um, uh, the, the you know DOD replicator project, which uh, the design or the idea of that is let's get lots of small, cheap munitions slash uh, unmanned uh, systems into the battle space. And I think about, well, you're going to need some space to launch those from, right? Um I, I also think about when we, we talked a couple weeks ago to the uh, the CEOs of the um, LCS squadrons on the East Coast and the West Coast and the admiral in charge of the LCS program. One of the things they kept talking about was the size of the flight decks on both of those ships, um, which are still both smaller than the, than the flight deck on the ESB. And they talked about testing a containerized, sorry, containerized, you know, you got the, the Naval Strike Missile or containerized SM6 mm -hmm. in a surface to surface mode, right? And, and with the LS, uh, the LCSs, they just done a test where they took the, um, a containerized SM6, they bolted it to the, uh, to the flight deck of, uh, of um, uh, one of the LCSs um, and did a very successful shot with it. But then they could also, they could also deinstall it within like 90 minutes when they pull back into port. So these, this ability to, to add payloads and, you know, the, the mission modularity, the ability to swap out and do different things with something that's got a large flight deck, I think is very attractive. And it might not have been something we were thinking about in, in ship design, you know, even five, 10 years ago. Yeah, I, I think, you know, like I said, another way of putting that that you'll hear in industry a lot is, you know, uh, capabilities vice platforms. So you're, what is the effect you're looking for? Is it you, you want a warhead on a target? Well, there are a, a thousand and one ways to do that. Um, it doesn't have to be a jet taking off of a carrier with a specific missile. It could be a V-22 with a containerized missile out the back, which is parachuted out and the coordinates are, you know, put out other well, somewhere else in the kill web, perhaps by a surface ship that also does not want to radiate. And you have the, the uh, aircraft do that. And same thing, even the LSD, the capacity for unmanned surface ships, which we saw the effectiveness of those, you know, in the Black Sea recently, uh, undersea vessels, things like that can be launched. Um, again, you're, the size of the platform gives you that modularity and the, you know, once you start detaching yourself from the idea that, you know, a MU is always a LHA, an LPD, and an LSD, and you think, okay, our objective is to carry this many air assets, this many Marines, and this many effectors, and this many logist logisticians, there's a million of ones, maybe a combination of commercially derived ships with a LHA or an L LPD somewhere loosely uh, tasked, uh, you know, in the vicinity, along with the uh, you know, some portion of the SAC. Um, so there's all sorts of ways you can mix and match depending on the mission. Uh, and we have to sort of get away from the legacy construct of there's an amphibious ready group, there's a SAG, and there's a carrier battle group. These things all have to be able to interconnect. Um, and the more we get into that mindset, both for warheads, people, putting Marines on you know, dispersed islands, how do we get them there? There's a million ways to, to skin that cat. Yeah, and uh, to your point, this is also in your article. You 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 know you talk about uh, the the ability to do surface to surface connectors, so LCACs um, and and um, uh, you know landing ships from an ESD or uh, helicopters or you know tilt rotor um, that you can move Marines. You can move Marines and stuff much farther from 
sea to shore uh, from this kind of capability than you can from an LSM, right? Because the LSM, as you point out, it's going to have to drive right up on the beach to detach what it's what it's carrying, right? Right. I think that you know the the the, the, the beaching is a major limitation, and although. Presumably, the LSM is, is also supposed to be commercially derived. It'll resemble a civilian ship. We have to assume that the co reconnaissance covers that a China-type threat is going to have. There's a, a substantial chance that aircraft that's, uh, that ship is going to be uh, spotted, and then that that tracks can be captured and, and maintained. So it, they'll we'll know exactly where the Marines within a, a very small area, you know, area of uncertainty where those Marines are. Um, based on the on the track of that ship, whereas you know either LSD using LCACs, surface ship to shore connectors, and LCUs all have ranges in the hundreds of nautical miles um, that they can you know do uh, deviate from the, the track of the ship, um, do several fake insertions. Same thing with the ESB. Both V22s and CH53s can lift substantial end items as part of that uh, that Marine uh, detachment, mostly the 53K in particular. Uh, so again, with multiple fake insertions, that sort of thing, the area of uncertainty and the dilemma for the enemy kind of goes up when you disaggregate the insertion platform from the ship, and the LSM just can't do that. The LPD can, but again, that's a low-density asset, very high dollar, and it's probably going to also demand substantial escort as well in a high-threat environment, just like the ESD and ESB do. Um, so again, in terms of survivability for those Marines, that, that's a big asset for them as well. So we've already kind of touched on this, but uh, what I'm sort of sensing in, as a theme here is that the commercially derived solutions seem to be becoming more feasible and, and maybe perhaps more important in, in addressing some of the military requirements gaps. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I think we, you know, we talked a lot in the SWAT, probably more than anybody really wants to hear from a non-engineering background, but as we've seen the last couple of years, you know, the Ukraine thing has, has brought this even more to the fore is the industrial capacity, industrial base is lacking. Um, a lot of these ships we currently have, a lot of the aircraft, it's, you know, across the, the realm of capabilities, they're very specialized, made with specialized tooling, specialized technicians that manufacture them. And even if we rain dollars from, air, you know, C-130s from the sky, the money is not going to fix that problem fast enough for us. Um, and so we have to start tapping into that that depth that commercial shipyards have, that commercial uh, aircraft manufacturers have. And okay, how do we get, again go into that capabilities uh, vice platforms? Okay, if you have if you build in both the the electronic architecture, the you know modular open systems approach on the electronic standpoint, but then if you have the addition the spare space and weight in that platform, whether it's air, sea, subsurface, um, then you can start thinking. Okay, what effects can I put on there? Uh, what payloads, you know, in terms of cargo, logistics kind of put on there and start to mix and match those things. And, and you may not get the bespoke solution, but that bespoke solution might not be ready until 2035. And that's well past the window where we need it. So the good enough is better than the perfect solution too late. Uh, and that's what that commercial solution offers. And that that's capacity thing, you know, plus the modularity, I, I think is a uh, something that's I think just now is starting to be appreciated in the defense establishment within the last few years. Yeah, and it, it, I'm also struck by when you talk about you know the commercial options give you the chance to put more players on the field, right? You didn't use that term, but I did because uh, that's the you know that's one of the terms that that uh, the new CNO Admiral Franchetti is talking about. I mean, one of her goals is to put more players on the field, and that's not just uh, you know, sailors and and uh, and Marines, but also the platforms that they'll use. And if you're gonna, if we're gonna put more players on the field across the globe, um, you're gonna have to be able to field ships and aircraft and submarines and platforms much more quickly and more affordably. Because as you said, those those C-130s loaded with you know hundred dollar bills, they're that I don't see them over Annapolis today. So and even unlimited funding is not going to fix the, the problem. There's just not enough shipyards. So yeah. we have yeah. to start looking for other solutions. And, I, and it goes back to that risk versus, you know, we have a tactical risk of the platform itself. And we always want the bespoke platform that exactly fits the requirements. Um, but if that's not going to be available, okay, what's our other option? And this is not the entire package. There's definitely a place for dedicated amphibious shipping dedicated naval ships, but this is a big part in getting that mass 
Um, you know, Stalin may have said, you know, quantity has a quality all its own, and we're not. I'm not fully in that camp. Uh, you, you just, it's, it's. But there is a modern technology and modern engineering gives us options that we can start to build some of that quicker and take take advantage of the industrial base, the immense commercial industrial base the U.S. has and our allies. Yeah, all great points. And uh, back to my my uh, comment at the start of the discussion that this proceedings article. Uh, that you've written is uh, is kind of a classic. L let's look at a problem. Um, let's look at some solutions. Uh, what are what are some expedited ways that we can go about solving that problem? And to your point about tactical risk, you know, we we do tend to want. You, you use the word bespoke a number of times. We do tend to want that you know, high-end high-end capability that's going to be the best platform, right? But we can't ignore the strategic risk that we face right now inside this Davidson window, inside the fact that right now the Chinese Navy is building up much faster uh, than ours is. We haven't been able to build the numbers even across several different administrations that, that proclaim they want a 350 or a 380 ship Navy. That has not happened yet. Uh, and so there's a strategic risk risk that if you don't field enough platforms of any type, you know you're you're creating a problem a problem set a risk set for the United States. Um, yes, it might be riskier for individual Marines or sailors on a ship that's built to commercial, uh, you know, uh, commercial specifications versus military specifications. But okay, well, what if we what if we don't have either? <laughs> If we don't have either, there's a there's a, a serious strategic risk, and we're facing it right now. I think there's a uh, a team aspect to that as well. These things are not going to steam alone and unafraid. They are are part of a team, and you know it's if you're going to play a football game and you have 11 players on one side and only nine on the other, well, someone's going uncovered. Uh, conversely, you know if you can at least put someone some man on the field at, at free safety, you know at least you're prepared for that eventuality that uh, someone's throwing deep. Um, so by if our if our lineup is not full, uh, it's not and that that poses risk. Even a navalized ship, if its magazine is depleted because there's no other magazine afloat to shoot help it shoot or resupply it, or in the case of these you know, ESB and ESD, they have their own fuel bunkers that can transfer fuel to uh, um, other vessels. You know that's an asset in itself, um, and by not having that it's a danger for everyone who's there already because they don't have those resources available to them. So if it goes beyond the platform level vulnerability to looking at a system of mutually supporting elements, each one by itself, you wouldn't send an Arleigh Burke by itself to fight China. You, you know, by the same token, this wouldn't be going by itself either. And while you have to make good, good efforts to in increase survivability, um, you can add in, you know, the Marine Corps uh, medium range intercept capability can be strapped to the deck to enhance that survivability. Uh, SM6s can be strapped to the deck. That doesn't have the appropriate radars, no, but those can be queued by other platforms, uh, you know, in the battle group or in a larger battle space. So one integra when integrated, you can mitigate some of those threats, not all of them, but again, which is the greater threat? The, uh, the threat of not being adequately, you know, have, having adequate players on the field to, to the, uh, uh, CNO's point, or you know, yeah, you you may not have the uh, the starting lineup you want, but you have the starting lineup you have, and you fill every every player's position. You're probably in a better position overall, both for that guy and for the guy next to him, by not leaving a hole in the uh, defensive line. Well, that's a great great way to wrap it up, and we are unfortunately out of time. My guest today has been Major Carl Forsling, U.S. Marine Corps retired. His article is titled "Solve the Amphibious Shipping Shortfall." with ESDs and ESBs. It is in the April issue of Proceedings. Carl, thanks for writing for us and for being on the show today. Thanks, I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for the kind words, and uh, it's been a great conversation. Thanks. All right. Today's episode is brought to you by Valletta Industries. Today's episode is brought to you by Valletta Industries. Valletta Industries is a premier maritime and tactical training company founded and comprised of former U.S. Navy SEALs. They offer best-in-class trainers for the Department of Defense and local law enforcement. The Valletta team has a passion for instructing and continuing to support the mission of active duty personnel and first responders by lending their hard-earned experience to those brave Americans who still serve. If you're a government contractor looking for a great partner for your next big project, 
Valletta Industries is an SBA certified HUBZone and SDVOSB company. Valletta Industries, we solve problems. To learn more, go to www.vallettaindustries.com. We hope to see you next week at Modern Day Marine and at our annual meeting on the 8th of May. And until next episode, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.